The Battle of Broodsein was fought on 4 October 1917 near Ypres in Belgium, at the east end of the Gaelevelt Plateau, by the British 2nd and 5th Armies against the German 4th Army. The battle was the most successful Allied attack of the Third Battle of Ypres. Using bite-and-hold tactics, with objectives limited to what could be held against German counterattacks, the British devastated the German defence, which prompted a crisis among the German commanders and caused a severe loss of morale in the Fourth Army. Preparations were made by the Germans for local withdrawals and planning began for a greater withdrawal, which would entail the abandonment by the Germans of the Belgian coast, one of the strategic aims of the Flanders Offensive. After the period of unsettled but drier weather in September, heavy rain began again on 4 October and affected the remainder of the campaign, working more to the advantage of the German defenders, being pushed back onto far less damaged ground. The British had to move their artillery forward into the area devastated by shellfire and soaked by the autumn rains, restricting the routes on which guns and ammunition could be moved, presenting German artillery with easier targets. At the Battle of Poelkapel on 9 October, after several more days of rain, the German defence achieved a costly success, holding the approaches to Passchendaele village, the most tactically vital ground on the battlefield. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Tactical Developments The Battle of Broodsaind was the third of the developed form of British bite-and-hold attacks in the Flanders Offensive, conducted by the Second Army. The unseasonal heavy rains in August had hampered British attempts to advance along the Gaelevelt Plateau more than German attempts to maintain their positions. The plateau ran along the southern edge of the Ypres salient and formed an obstacle to further eastward attacks, preventing the Allies from advancing out of the salient. The British Expeditionary Force had transferred more guns and troops from the armies further south to reinforce the Second Army and force the Germans to defend the southern fringe of the plateau, diluting its firepower. Broussaint followed the Battle of the Menin Road Ridge on 20 September and the Battle of Polygon Wood on 26 September, which had captured much of the plateau and inflicted many casualties on the German defenders. The Fourth Army had undertaken at least 24 counterattacks since 20 September and several more after the Battle of Polygon Wood, particularly on 30 September and 1 October, when larger German organized counterattacks had been costly failures. On 28 September, Sir Douglas Haig had met Plumer and the 5th Army Commander General Hubert Goff to explain his intentions, in view of the victories of 20 and 26 September, the fine weather disarray among the German defenders and the limited prospect of German reinforcements arriving from the Russian front. Haig, judged, that the next attack, due on 6 October, would conclude the period of strictly limited advances. The following step would be a deeper advance, with provision made for exploitation. Haig wanted 15 corps on the Belgian coast and the amphibious force of Operation Hush readied, in case of a general withdrawal by the Germans. Reserve formations of infantry, artillery, cavalry and tanks were to be made ready behind the 5th and 2nd armies, to exploit a successful attack. Goff and Plumer replied over the next couple of days, that they felt that the proposals were premature and that exploitation would not be feasible until Passchendaele Ridge had been captured as far as Westrusp. Capturing the ridge would probably take two more steps at three-day intervals, followed by another four days to repair roads over the captured ground. Haig explained that although it was not certain that the attack due on 10 October could be exploited, he desired the armies to make the arrangements, since they could always be used at a later date. Chapter 2 – Prelude Chapter 2 – Section 1 – British Preparations the British tactical refinements, had sought to undermine the German defence in depth, by limiting objectives to a shallower penetration than fighting the principal battle against Angreif divisions as they counter-attacked, rather than against the local defenders. By further reorganising the infantry reserves, Plumer had ensured that the depth of the attacking divisions corresponded closer to the depth of the local German counter-attack reserves and their Angreif divisions, providing more support for the advance and consolidation against German counter-attacks. 
Divisions attacked on narrower fronts and troops advanced no more than 1,500 yards into the German defense zone, before consolidating their position. When the Germans counter-attacked, they encountered a reciprocal defense in depth, protected by a mass of artillery like the British Green and Black Lines on 31 July and suffered many casualties to little effect. The tempo of the British operations added to the difficulty the Germans had in replacing tired divisions through the transport bottlenecks behind the German front. The Battle of the Menin Road Ridge on 20 September, was the first attack with the more limited territorial objectives developed since 31 July, to benefit from the artillery reinforcements brought into the Second Army area and a pause of three weeks for preparation, during which the clouds dispersed and the sun began to dry the ground. The shorter intervals between attacks since then had several effects, allowing less time for either side to prepare and the Germans had to take more risks on the rest of the Western Front, to replace tired and depleted divisions in Flanders. German troops and ammunition trains overloaded the rail network in West Flanders, while more German artillery escaped British counter-battery fire and less time was available for wire-cutting and pillbox destruction, although the Germans generally left these to give battle in the open. The British artillery preparation before Polygon Wood on 26 September, began 24 hours before the infantry attack. No formal artillery preparation was conducted before 4 October, except for the normal heavy artillery counter-battery fire and destructive fire on German strong points to mislead the Germans as to the date and time of the infantry attack, when a hurricane bombardment was to be fired at zero hour, practice barrages were begun on 27 September and increased, to two barrages a day from 1 October. Despite the ruse of using practice barrages, a very reliable agent informed the Germans that an attack was coming from as early as 1 October. The battle was almost called off when heavy rain began again on 2 October, turning parts of the ground into a morass. British military intelligence predicted the German defensive changes after the defeats of 20 and 26 September, in an intelligence summary of 1 October which led to the British being ready for Unternehmen Hohensturm, a big German counter-attack to recapture the area around Zonnebeck on 4 October. Chapter 2 Section 2 Plan the attack aimed to complete the capture of the Gaelevelt Plateau by the occupation of Brood Seine Ridge and Gravenstaffel Spur. This would protect the southern flank of the British line and permit attacks on Passchendaele Ridge to the northeast. The attack was planned for 6 October, to give the 2nd Anzac Corps time to prepare. Haig was anxious about the possibility of deteriorating weather and on 26 September, was able to order the date to be advanced by two days, because of the quick relief of V Corps by the 2nd Anzac Corps north of the Ypres Rulers Railway. Twelve divisions were involved in the attack on a 14,000 yards front. The original plan was to have the I Anzac Corps relieved after the Battle of Polygon Wood but the Corps had fewer casualties and was fresher than expected and it remained in the front line. The 9th Corps was to attack with the 37th Division in the area beyond Tower Hamlets, south of the Ypres Menin Road, the X Corps was to attack with the 5th Division in the Ryuklebeek Valley, the 21st Division and 7th Division on a 1,400 yards front further north up to Polygon Wood, to take Ryukl and the ground overlooking the village. The two right flanking corps had 972 field guns and howitzers supported by 417 heavy and medium pieces. In the Ianzac Corps area, the 1st Australian Division objectives required an advance of 1,200 to 1,800 yards, the 2nd Australian Division 1,800 to 1,900 yards on 1,000 yards front dot in the 2nd Anzac Corps area. The 3rd Australian Division objectives were 1,900 to 2,100 yards deep, also on a 1,000 yards frontage and the New Zealand Division objectives were 1,000 yards deep on a 2,000 yards front. The first objective for the Anzac Divisions was set just short of the crest of Broussaint Ridge and the final objective another 200 to 400 yards beyond. The flanking corps conformed to this depth of advance and also attacked with one battalion for the first objective per brigade and two for the final objective, except in the second Anzac Corps, where two intermediate objectives were set for the third Australian division, 
because of the state of the ground with a battalion of each brigade for each objective. The artillery plan had the first belt of creeping barrage beginning 150 yards beyond the jumping off tapes. After three minutes the barrage was to creep forward by 100 yards lifts in four minutes for 200 yards, when the machine gun barrage would begin, then every six minutes to the protective line, 200 yards beyond first objective. During the pause the barrage was to move 1,000 yards further to hit German counter-attacks and then suddenly return. At 0 plus 130 minutes, it was to advance in 100 yards lifts every 8 minutes to the final objective. After another pause the barrage was to creep forward at hourly intervals for 1,500 yards into the German defences. The defensive barrage by the first two belts from the field artillery was to stop at 11.20 am except for SOS fire and the two back belts of heavy and medium artillery at 1.44 pm. Chapter 2 Section 3 German Preparations From the middle of 1917, the area east of Ypres was defended by six German defensive positions, the front line, Albrechtstellung, Wilhelmstellung, Flondern-Eistellung, Flondern 2 Stellung and Flondern 3 Stellung. In between the German defense positions lay the Belgian villages of Zonnebeck and Passchendaele. The German fortifications had been breached in several places since the start of the British assault on 31 July 1917. Ludendorff met the local commanders at Rulers on 29 September where the complete breakdown of the German defensive system was described to him. Ludendorff ordered a strengthening of forward garrisons by the ground-holding divisions. All available machine guns including those of the support and reserve battalions of the front-line regiments, were sent into the forward zone to form a cordon of four to eight guns every 250 yards. Ground-holding divisions were reinforced by the Storse regiment of each of the Eingreif divisions, which were moved up behind each front division into the artillery protective line, which backed onto the forward battle zone, to launch earlier counter-attacks while the British were consolidating. The bulk of the Eingreif divisions were to be held back and used for a methodical counter-attack on the next day or the one after and for spoiling attacks between British offensives. These changes were incorporated in a 4th Army Operation Order of 30 September. Operations to inflict greater losses on British infantry under the instructions of the 22nd of September were to continue, with more bombardment by field artillery and by using at least half of the heavy artillery ammunition allotment for observed fire on infantry positions, captured pillboxes, command posts, machine gun nests, tracks and field railways. Gas bombardment was to be increased on forward infantry positions and artillery emplacements whenever the winds allowed. Every effort was to be made to induce the British to reinforce their forward positions, where the German artillery could engage them. Between 26 September and 3 October, the Germans attacked and counter-attacked at least 24 times. On 1 October, two regiments from the 4th Reserve and the 8th Divisions and the 4th Army Sturm Battalion under the command of General von Gabane, attacked Polygon Wood. The attack began at 5.30 am in the area taken over from the Australians by X Corps. The 21st and 7th Divisions and the neighbouring Australian battalion to the north forced most of the German infantry under cover in shell holes and in no man's land, with massed small arms fire. The German attack advanced a maximum of 140 yards at Cameron Covert, for which the 210 reserve infantry regiment suffered 356 casualties. An attempt to renew the advance after more artillery fire failed. Operation High Storm, a bigger German organized counterattack, intended to recapture the area around Zonnebeck which had been planned for the 3rd of October, was postponed for a day. Chapter 3, Lattel. Chapter 3 Section 1, Second Army. In 9 Corps the 37th Division attacked with two brigades, the 19th Division on the right cooperating with an artillery and machine gun barrage and a smoke screen. The right brigade pivoted on the southern flank amid much German small arms fire but captured the first objective on the Tower Hamlets Spur. German counter-attacks and fire from Joist, Trench and Berry Cottage then pushed the right flank units back to their start line. 
The left brigade was fired on from a pillbox and Lewis farm, which had been missed by the bombardment and which hindered an attack on dugouts along the north end of Gaylevelt Wood. The brigade, Dugin in short of the final objective, Tower Trench was captured but then abandoned, also due to the fire from Lewis Farm. In X Corps, the 5th Division attacked with two brigades. By coincidence, the German 19th Reserve Division was about to attack and was caught in the British bombardment. The right brigade was delayed by fire from the 37th Division area, believed to be from Lewis Farm, and a defensive front was established facing the pillbox. The centre of the brigade were able to keep pace with the barrage and consolidated the objective by 12.30 pm. The battalion on the left attacked between the Skeria Beak and Ryukbeak towards Polderhook Chateau, advancing 700 yards with the assistance of a tank, before being halted and having to dig in. To the north, the left flank brigade was fired on from Cameron Covert and scattered pillboxes as it advanced. After a long delay Cameron Cops was captured with the help of three tanks moving down the Reutel Road. The final objective at Juniper Hill was reached but was then abandoned, due to being exposed to machine gun and artillery fire. The attackers sidestepped to the north of the Reutel Road and linked with troops from the 21st Division. German troops counter-attacked eight times and regained Polderhook Spur, leaving the new front line along the west of Cameron Covert and just short of Chateau Wood. Two brigades of the 21st Division attacked at 6 a.m. onto ground held by the German 19th Reserve Division, backed by part of the 17th Division, the Eingreif Division between the Menin Road and Polygon Wood. The going varied from marsh to hard ground, which could support the four attached tanks and caused shells to ricochet. The right brigade advanced under heavy machine gun fire and took Joist Farm before being obstructed by marshy ground and pillboxes to the right. British bombing sections attacked the pillboxes and cut off Juniper Trench to reach the objective. Fire from a blockhouse at the east end of Reutel caused a delay until it was knocked out by a tank and a counterattack from the southeast was dispersed around noon by artillery and small arms fire. The left brigade crossed the Polygon Beak and captured a portion of Juniper Trench and the pillbox. At Judge Trench the brigade consolidated, a further advance came under fire from Judge Copps but was able to dig in and hold the ground. By 9 a.m. most of the divisional objectives had been captured, giving observation to the southeast down the Reutel Valley. Massed small arms fire from the Polderhook Spur caused many casualties in the 64th Brigade on the right, which withdrew slightly to sheltered ground, without sacrificing the commanding position which protected the right flank of the Anzac or further north. The right brigade of the 7th Division advanced against light resistance to the first objective but came under fire from machine guns in the 21st Division area. As the neighbouring division came up the 91st Brigade was able to resume its advance towards Indair Stir Cabaret until fire from Joiner's Rest held them up. Reinforcements allowed the final objective to be taken. A defensive flank was formed along Jolting Houses Road and Jetty Trench, meeting the 21st Division to the west of Reutel. The left brigade had an easy advance to the first objective. As the attack continued some troops crossed into the area of the 1st Australian Division, causing a gap but the German defenders were not able to exploit this and the final objective was reached. Occupation of the Indersteur Plateau gave the two divisions observation over the lower part of the valley, enfilading ground on which any counter-attack from the south against the 1st Australian Division must move. The main attack was conducted by the two Anzac Corps. When the I Anzac Corps was ready to attack, a German artillery bombardment fell on it at 5.30 am causing many casualties. As the Australian divisions advanced at 6 am, they met the German 212th Infantry Regiment from the 45th Reserve Division and the 4th Guard Division in No Man's Land. The 1st Australian Division, advancing with two brigades, routed the Germans and continued the advance beyond Flondern and Estellung. The right brigade advanced beyond the first objective and had to fall back behind the British protective barrage to consolidate. The left brigade picked its way through marshy ground and tree stumps in Romulus and Remus woods, north of Molnailstuk and then outflanked a group of blockhouses, some troops crossing into the 2nd Australian Division area. The first objective was taken at 7.15 am, 
German field guns opened fire from the Bekelier Brood St. Passchendaele Road and were attacked and captured. Fresh battalions continued the advance, were fired on from Retaliation Farm and a German headquarters in a shell hole. The troops advanced about a third of the way up the road from Molnayels took to be clear until they were cleared. At 8.10 am the advance resumed to the final objective which was consolidated and outposts established in front of it, despite long-range fire from the Keyberg Spur and a small rise northeast of Brudsaint village. Attempts were made by parties of German infantry to counter-attack at noon around Dame House, from Celtic Wood at 1 p.m. and at Flint Farm at 2.30 p.m. and two attempts to mass around Flondern to Stellung at the Keyberg Spur, to the south of Passchendaele village, which were stopped by artillery fire. The 2nd Australian Division moved up to the front line during the night, amidst rain which began around midnight. Along with the 1st Australian Division it was caught in the German preparatory bombardment for Unternehmen, Hohensturm but this stopped when the British hurricane bombardment began at 6 a.m., as the Australian advance began. The 6th and 7th Brigades had to pass either side of Zonnebeck Lake and saw German troops opposite them rise from shell holes and begin to advance. The Australian troops began to fire on the move and destroyed the first German wave, at which those to the rear retreated back into the British creeping barrage, while others retired in stages through Zonnebeck. Germans hidden in the ruins were rushed by the following Australian battalion, before they could shoot many of the Australians who had passed beyond. The Australians had overrun German troops from the 45th Reserve and the 4th Guard Divisions, having forestalled the German infantry attack and then took several field guns along the way. The battalions pressed on beyond the first objective and reached the final objective east of Broodsain village. The left brigade met snipers in Zonnebeck and then more fire from a large number of machine guns in Daisy Wood. The brigade chose an old British trench to consolidate, about 200 yards, short of the final objective dot in the second Anzac Corps area, the 3rd Australian Division had to assemble west of Hill 40 on the north side of the Ypres Rulers Railway which had not been captured by the 3rd Division on 26 September. Delays in assembling were caused by German flares which illuminated the approaches to the hill. The division was to assemble its attacking battalions in widely spaced lines due to the state of the ground, intending that the troops behind the initial waves were to escape a German barrage by being far enough behind the British front line. These areas were found to be under fire when the troops arrived, so they were squeezed up like those in the other divisions. The attack began at 6 a.m. with two brigades. The right brigade advanced quickly over the near crest, then paused on the first objective before advancing in section columns to the red line on the right, the left coming up after a delay caused by the Alma blockhouse and some pillboxes nearby. The leading battalion of the 10th Brigade on the left had edged so far forward that when the advance began, it was 30 yards from the pillboxes at Levi Cottages at the top of the rise, beyond which was a dip then the slope of Graven Staffel Ridge. The pillboxes were quickly taken, followed by Alma and Judah House in the dip after a short delay. After a 12-minute pause at this objective, to give the New Zealanders on the left time to cross the boggy ground in their area, the two following battalions leapfrogged through, that of the right brigade taking many German prisoners from dugouts along the railway embankment and reaching the red line quickly. After a delay caused by the British bombardment dwelling for nearly half an hour, the left brigade advanced up Graven Staffel Spur and then pressed on to silence several machine guns in pillboxes on Abraham Heights. By 7.20 am all of the 3rd Australian Division was on the red line while swarms of German prisoners were taken by the brigade mopping up behind the advanced troops. At 8.10 am the advance resumed, and after a pause to capture Seine pillbox, the right brigade crossed Flondern I Stellung, which lay diagonally across its path and reached the final objective. The 10th Brigade on the left was held up by fire from machine gun nests in the New Zealand Division area, until they were taken by a party from the supporting battalion. The advance resumed under heavy fire from positions in Flondern I Stellung where the barrage had passed over. Troops on the right established several machine gun posts and enfiladed the Germans further north while troops crossed into the New Zealand area, and outflanked the German positions from the north. 
The final objective was reached by 9.12 am and the ground consolidated. The New Zealand division continued the attack with two brigades on a 2,000 yards front. The German bombardment which began at 5.30 am fell between the foremost New Zealand troops and their supporting battalions. The division had 180 18-pounders and 64.5-inch howitzers for its creeping barrage in front of the four deeper barrages fired by 60 machine guns and the 2nd Anzac Corps medium and heavy artillery. When the infantry advance began, the German infantry who had assembled for their attack and been devastated by the British artillery barrage, were met after 200 yards. The German survivors were dispersed, many being killed in bayonet fighting or taken prisoner before the New Zealand infantry found that they could cross the morass around the Hanabeek more easily than expected. The 4th Brigade on the right took Duchy Farm and Riverside easily, paused to capture Otto Farm and then reached the first objective and dug in. Fresh battalions resumed the advance, captured two pillboxes in Berlin Wood, two unexpected pillboxes and then captured Berlin Farm. The 1st Brigade attack on the left, veered north beyond the Hanabeek, and was fired on from Aviatic Farm and Deer House, which were taken by a trench mortar and grenade attack. Fire from the Winsig, Albatross Farm and Winchester Blockhouses, in the 48th Division area further north, delayed the advance until they were captured. More pillboxes at Portlia were taken by the left flanking battalion of the 4th Brigade and the Red Line was reached. A position near Karek was attacked, despite being beyond the first objective and under British artillery fire. The advance to the final objective, between Flondair and Istelung where it met the Ypres Rulers Railway, north to Kronprinz Farm on the Strumik began and a German battalion headquarters was captured in the Waterloo pillboxes. Calgary Grange and Kronprinz Farm held out for a while longer but the final objective, after an advance of 1,000 yards was reached and consolidated. Chapter 3 Section 2, Fifth Army In the 18th Corps area, the 48th Division attacked with one brigade at 6 a.m. Vale House and Winsig on the right fell quickly, then machine gun fire slowed the advance and some New Zealand troops strayed across the divisional boundary, causing confusion around Albatross Farm and Wellington Farm. Once Wellington and Winchester Farms had been captured, the advance resumed to the Strumik. As night fell, the division relieved the New Zealanders in the divisional area and took more ground. In the centre the division captured German posts west of the Strumik and was then was held up by fire from the area of York Farm. Eventually the advance was halted 300 yards short of Vache Farm. A renewal of the attack with reinforcements was not able to overcome German machine gun fire. On the left, the attack was immediately hampered by massed machine gun fire. Tweed House was captured and contact made with troops further north from the 11th Division. Beck House was reached but further south the attackers were forced back. A resumption of the attack at 5 p.m. was cancelled due to rain and poor light. The 11th Division had attacked at 6 a.m. with two brigades and ten tanks of D Battalion, 1st Tank Brigade. On the right, the advance took Malta House and reached an intermediate line, where a small counter attack was defeated. Fire from the church and the brewery pillbox in Pole Capel caused a delay, but Gloucester Farm was captured with the aid of two tanks and the Red Line consolidated. Troops from the inner flanks of both brigades and several tanks entered Pohl Kappel, and then captured pillboxes beyond the east end. The left brigade had an easy advance to the intermediate line and then overcame small parties of German infantry concealed in shell holes. A shelter was captured near the church in Pohl Kappel amid sniper fire. Ferdin House was captured and the final objective consolidated. A defensive flank was thrown back to maintain touch with the 4th Division to the north, whose advance had been pushed back 400 yards by German counterattacks. A counterattack in the 11th Division area at 1 pm was defeated, and reinforcements allowed the new line to be established between the Steenbeek and the Lonamark Winnipeg Road 14 Corps guarded the northern flank of the attack. The 4th Division attacked with two brigades at 6 am, the brigade on the right flank took Kangaroo Trench but was held up on the first objective by small arms fire from Lemnos House. 
Troops on the extreme right combined with infantry of the 11th Division to capture a pillbox on the Pohl Kappel Road. As they reached the next objective, Ferdin House was outflanked, then the Green Line was consolidated amidst fire from 19 Meter Hill. The left brigade troops lost direction crossing the marshy ground about the Lauterbeek and were fired on from the flank as they reached a road beyond 19 Meter Hill. After an hour's pause the advance resumed but machine gun fire stopped the attack and the ground captured was consolidated. A German counterattack at 3 p.m. made good progress until reinforcements drove it back. A gap on the boundary with the 29th Division to the north was filled as dark fell and German infantry assembling for a counterattack were spotted and dispersed by artillery fire. A line from Ferdin House to Kangaroo Huts, west of Tragic A Farm and 19 Meter Hill was consolidated. The 29th Division was to attack astride the Ypres Sadden Railway and form a defensive flank overlooking the Bromic, with troops from two brigades. The right brigade took Chinese House and the Tigoid Terrace Vessen Farm, as it formed a flank along the junction with the 4th Division further south. As a German counterattack forced back elements of the 4th Division, the 29th Division troops stopped them with flanking machine gun fire and drove them back, allowing the 4th Division to regain the lost ground. North of the railway several pillboxes were captured by the left brigade and observation posts established. Chapter 3 Section 3 – Air Operations Wind, rain and low cloud stopped long-range air operations and severely restricted the British air effort over the battlefield. British air observers sent 49 zone calls and observed artillery fire on 26 targets. The observer used a call sign of the map square letter then the zone letter to signal to the artillery. All guns and howitzers up to six enabled to bear on the target opened rapid fire using corrections of aim from the air observer, five battlefield reconnaissance flights, ten contact patrols and two counterattack patrols of the ones attempted succeeded, particularly those of four squadron, and twenty-one squadron, which observed the flares of the attacking troops at the first and final objectives on much of the front attacked and provided the infantry with a measure of air support, despite the weather. Chapter 3 Section 4, German Fourth Army Unternehmen Hohensturm, a counterattack plan for the 4th of October, was intended to recapture as much of the ridge on Groot Molen Spur as possible. The German troops had assembled for the organized counterattack, when the British bombardment swamped them. Reserve Infantry Regiment 212 of the 45th Reserve Division supported by the 4th Guard Division, was caught in the open along with regiments from the 4th Bavarian Division, the Bavarians tried to counterattack the Australians, who had overrun the German attack. After the 29th of September, the bulk of the Eingraef divisions were held back, battalions and a few regiments from the 8th and 22nd Divisions at Indersturr, the 45th Reserve and 4th Bavarian Divisions opposite Brood Saint Ridge and the 16th Division south of Poelkapel. The Eingraef units were committed as reinforcements for the remnants of the front holding divisions and suffered many losses from British artillery and machine guns. The most successful counter-attack was made by an improvised force from the front holding 19th Reserve Division and parts of the 17th Division, the local Eingraef Division, which advanced up Reutelbeek Valley, took Reutel and Cameron Covert and reinforced Polderhook Chateau, before being stopped by British artillery and machine gun fire. Sparse and poorly aimed shell fire, ineffective counter-attacks and disorganization demonstrated the severity of the German defeat. The Germans had been reduced to a foothold on the Gaelevelt Plateau, and the southern flank of Passchendaele Ridge had become vulnerable to attack. Chapter 3 Section 5 – Exploitation Considered As news arrived of the great success of the attack, Brigadier General John Charteris, head of GHQ Intelligence, went from Haig's advanced headquarters to the Second Army headquarters to discuss the possibility of improvising an exploitation of the victory. Plumer declined the suggestion, as eight fresh German divisions were behind the battlefield with another six beyond them. Plumer preferred to wait until the expected German counterattacks had been defeated, as Haig had directed. German artillery fire was unsubdued, 
and the defences of Flandern II Stellung and Flandern III Stellung could be garrisoned by the German divisions behind the front. An attack on these positions would need artillery support, which would be limited, given that the British field artillery was behind a severely battered strip of muddy ground two miles deep, firing close to the limit of their range. Later in the day, Plumer had second thoughts and ordered Ianzac Corps to push on to the Keyberg Spur, with support from two Anzac Corps. Birdwood wanted to wait until artillery had been brought up and supply routes improved, Godley preferred to advance northeastwards, towards Passchendaele village. Lieutenant General Thomas Morland proposed an attack northwards, from Indestur into the southern flank of the Germans opposite Ianzac Corps, which was opposed by Major General Herbert Shoebridge the 7th Division commander, due to uncertainty and the many casualties in the 21st Division on his right flank. At 2 p.m. Plumer decided that exploitation was not possible. At 10.30 a.m., Goff had told the 5th Army Corps commanders to push on and to attack again at 5 p.m. but when reports arrived of a repulse of the 4th Division at 19-metre hill on the junction of 18 and 14 Corps, the attack was cancelled. Chapter 4, Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1, Analysis The capture of the ridges was a great success and Plumer called the attack, the greatest victory since the Marne and Der Weltkrieg, the German official history, referred to, the Black Day of October 4. There had been an average advance of 1,000 yards and the 3rd Australian Division moved forward up to 1,900 yards. The X Corps divisions had managed to take most of their objectives about 700 yards forward, gaining observation over the Reutelbeek Valley but had relinquished ground in some exposed areas. The British artillery fired a standing barrage for two and a half hours while the infantry dug in undisturbed and German counter-attacks were dispersed with artillery fire. Wet ground had caused some units to lag behind the creeping barrage, as well as reducing the effect of shells, many landing in mud and being smothered, although this affected German artillery equally. The British had great difficulty moving artillery and ammunition from the west end of the Gaelevelt Plateau to the eastern edge facing Passchendaele. Field guns closest to Passchendaele were 5,000 yards from Broodsend, for the Battle of Mazines, the safe maximum, was 6,200 yards for the 18-pounders and 7,000 yards for the 4.5-inch howitzers. Jack Sheldon wrote in 2007 that tired German units had been rushed back into action to fill gaps, despite the risks. The 4th Army report for the 4th of October was accurate but the OHL communique of the 5th of October was full of lies to obscure the magnitude of the defeat. In his diary entry for the 4th of October, Ruprecht wrote that the British advance had lengthened the front, which made the defence more difficult and that a counter-attack from Bekelier and Gaylevelt was necessary. In 2008, J. P. Harris wrote that the imminent German attack had backfired and that many of the extra men near the front line had been killed, the number German dead being unprecedented and the British took 4,700 prisoners. Most of the British objectives were captured by the combination of artillery and infantry, on the front of 18 Corps 12 tanks had also been effective. The rains began again and the tactics being used by the British were unworkable in such conditions. Ammunition had to be carried further and in the mud was a Herculean task, accuracy and rate of fire were severely reduced in the poor visibility and unstable wooden platforms built to mount the guns as the ground turned to mud. In his anxiety to press on, Haig chose the 8th of October for the next attack, just when great care was needed adequately to prepare and although the attack was postponed for a day much of the field artillery was out of action. In 2018, Jonathan Borff wrote that after the war the Reichsarchive official historians, many of whom were former staff officers, ascribed the tactical changes in the wake of the defeat of 26 September and their reversal after the Battle of Brutsend on 4 October, to Lorsberg. The other German commanders were exculpated and a false impression created that OHL operated in a rational manner, when Ludendorff imposed another defensive scheme on 7 October. Borff called this narrative facile, because it avoided the problem faced by the Germans in late 1917. OHL sent orders to change tactics again days before Lorsberg had issued orders to the 4th Army, but he was blamed for them. 
Borff also doubted that all of the divisions in Flanders could act quickly on top-down demands for change. The 119th Division had been in the front line since 11 August and replied that the new tactics were difficult to implement without training. The tempo of British attacks and attrition meant that there was increase of six divisions in the 4th Army by the 10th of October but that they were either novice divisions, deficient in training or veteran divisions with low morale after earlier defeats. The Germans were seeking tactical changes for an operational dilemma, because no operational answer existed. On the 2nd of October, Ruprecht ordered the 4th Army HQ to avoid over-centralizing command only to find that Lorsberg had issued an artillery plan detailing the deployment of individual batteries. Chapter 4 Section 2 – Casualties A German officer wrote that the ordeal in the swampy area in the dark and the fog, was indescribable. In Volume 13 of the German Official History, Der Weltkrieg, the official historians recorded 35,000 casualties for the period 1 to 10 October. The 45th Reserve Division suffered 2,883 casualties and the 4th Guard Division 2,786. The British took 4,759 German prisoners, increasing the total to see. 10,000 since 20 September. Second Army casualties for the week ending the 4th of October were 12,256, the 2nd Anzac Corps suffered 3,500 casualties, including 1,663 New Zealanders the 21st Division suffered 2,616 casualties, the highest loss in the 2nd Army. 5th Army casualties for the week to the 5th of October were 3,305. Calculations of German losses by the British official historian have been severely criticized ever since. Chapter 4 Section 3 – Subsequent Operations On 5 October, the 21st Division captured a blockhouse and next day a reconnaissance by the 2nd Australian Division revealed Daisy would to be strongly held. On 7 October, Parties from the 49th Division raided Celtic Wood and the 48th Division was repulsed at Burns House and Vachet Farm. Celtic Wood was raided again by a battalion of the 1st Australian Division on 9 October. There was anxiety among the British commanders about wet weather affecting operations again, just as the Germans appeared to be close to collapse. The increased tempo of attack allowed by the systematic planning and decentralization of responsibility from army to corps and divisions and the reduction of much of the planning to a routine, led to the time between attacks being further reduced. As optimism at the possibility of advancing over the Passchendaele watershed increased, the faster attack preparations reduced the time available for artillery to prepare assaults and combined with the beginning of the autumn rains after the 4th of October, substantially to reduce British artillery support during the Battle of Pohl Kappel on 9 October and the First Battle of Passchendaele on 12 October. Chapter 4 Section 4, Victoria Cross Acting Lieutenant Colonel Philip Bent of the 7th Division, the 1st of October.9 Victoria Crosses were awarded during the Battle of Broodsaint, the 4th of October. Acting Sergeant Major James Ockenden of the 29th Division. Acting Captain Clement Robertson of the Royal Tank Regiment. Sergeant Charles Coverdale, from the 11th Division. Acting Corporal Fred Greaves of the 11th Division. Private Arthur Hutt from the 48th Division. Sergeant Lewis McGee of the 3rd Australian Division. Lance Corporal Walter Peeler, from the 3rd Australian Division. Acting Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Evans, of the 21st Division. Private Thomas Sage from the 37th Division.